You're listening to The New Paris. I'm your host, Lindsay Tremuda. Of all the cooking essentials we buy and consume, few are as taken for granted or even misrepresented as much as extra virgin olive oil. Imagine you're in France, okay? You're scanning the shelves in your local market for a new bottle. The labels might lead you to believe the oil is 100% French, Italian, or even Greek. But inspect the fine print and a fuller picture emerges. Pressed in Italy, produced outside of the European Union. And that's if the bottles specify that distinction at all. But if I learned anything from reporting a story for a far magazine about today's guest, it's just how much of the olive oil that's exported in the world is from another country and another region entirely. Tunisia is the world's third largest exporter and the first outside of the EU, and yet most people would be surprised to know this. Sarah Ben Ramdan, the French Tunisian founder of the brand Kaya, who splits her time between Paris and Medea, joins me today to go into the context of the olive oil business, the role French colonialism plays in Tunisia's erasure from the olive oil story, and how having a foot in Paris can help change the narrative. Sarah, welcome to the show. Thank you. You and I spent quite a bit of time together already, um, and I remember telling you when we first met that I I instantly wanted to have you on this show. But then I got a, a story to report, um, and that is for a far magazine, and then I thought, you know what, let's wait till that comes out so that I'm not spilling all the beans too soon. But, you know, but there was a lot that I couldn't include in that story, which is why this is the perfect occasion to to highlight all those things. So you've just come off of a quite... A hectic weekend yeah <laughs> uh at taste of paris which is a food festival um it's it's being held at the temporary grand palais which mm-hmm. i think is quite inferior to the actual grand palais i mean it loses some of that you know opulence yeah. and that grandeur but this was a big step for you because your brand is basically a covid baby right yeah my brand was launched almost two years ago so summer 2021. And the idea behind the brand um, emerged during COVID, summer 2020. So yeah, COVID baby. It was my first uh, fair, I guess, festival. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we're going to get to that because I, I it, it really leads into sort of, uh, you know, your presence in Paris. But before that, I, I, I really would love to have a bit of uh, context as to why... What is it that makes Tunisian olive oil so woefully unrecognized, I guess, in within the industry? What what are the things at play that have led to it being so such a, a brisk business, obviously for the country, and yet so few consumers in the world know how important Tunisia is in this market? Yeah, well, I think that's because Tunisia is a, first of all, a small country that's not part of the European Union. Um, its history is rooted in, I guess, uh, some, like some type of dependency to more powerful countries in Europe. Also, the history of Tunisia as being colonized by France, et cetera, makes, makes us just more vulnerable as people and as a nation and as a country. Um, and the fact that our economy is also, yeah, more fragile, um, uh, makes it cheaper for wealthier people to come to Tunisia and, and buy olive oil at a cheaper price. And that's been the case for like decades. And for that reason, yeah, big industrial, you know, players, mostly Italians, but not exclusively mm-hmm. have realized that there's an opportunity for them to go to Tunisia get olive oil at a cheaper price and then blend them with other olive oil, sometimes other oils, not just olive oils, because there's a ah. lot of fraud, yeah. And then resell them under European brand names without any mention of, you know, their origin. And yeah, so people, m- most people have probably already had Tunisian olive oil, but just Didn't don't realize know. it. Yeah. So it's, it's, so it's really a bulk uh, yeah. market. Um, why, you know, I think a lot of people would wonder, you know, because it's not as if there are no artisanal producers. You, you have taken over your family's, what, fifth, fifth generation? Yeah, estate. Estate. I mean, I haven't taken over the no, whole No, 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 sorry, but... that's true. <laughs> 
Um, One person taking over lots of acres of land. To um, Yeah, I mean, my family started producing olive oil in the late 19th century. And they were lucky for diverse reasons to be quite um, successful in that field. And so my great, great, great grandfather was the first citizen to ever export olive oil to the United States. I love that story. Where he actually won prices and we have those, you know, archives that are quite crazy. Um, and it's uh, an, act- an activity, a business that was passed on for, I'd say, two, three generations. And then people kind of moved on, I guess. They wanted to move to the capital, Tunis, because my family comes from a coastal, smaller town called mm-hmm. Mahdiya. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, I guess people made money and just were less connected to rurality and were happy to do other things. And then the country and society globally was moving on to other types of industries and services. And so this is what my family did as well. Although we kept the land and we continued to take care of it, there was just no uh, business that was actually coming out from it sure. as a brand, let's mm-hmm. say. Um, so this is when I come into the picture and I the, yeah. start a brand again. But I, yeah, other people in Tunisia have been doing that for a few decades as well. Um, but I feel like maybe their voices didn't get as much, uh, recognition mm-hmm. as mine, maybe. Mm-hmm. But also, I think from, and again, I know I'm, I'm going to say this as, you know, the, the our listeners, weren't in our initial conversation, but something that struck me when I first spoke to you was you said that part of the reason this is like a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy for Tunisians in some cases where, you know, they they end up perpetuating the bulk model because they can't fi- they can't seem to find a way out mm-hmm. relates to kind of the damage done by the colonial mm-hmm. The colonial mindsets and the colonial power uh, that France held for for a quite a long time. Can you can you sort of elaborate on that and and sort of like why that remains something that's so difficult for, I think, the average worker to sort of emancipate themselves from? I mean, there is different like um, levels to that issue. First of all, I mean, when you when your country has been colonized by another country that is more powerful culturally, I mean, seems more powerful culturally, economically. Um, you grow up with this like complex, I guess, that you come from a place that is inferior. So for most Tunisians, there's always this like dream of going to Europe. And we see it today with, you know, the thousands of people risking their lives every day leaving um North Africa to Europe. So people still have this like fantasy of Europe being a place of better opportunities than their country. So there's this thing of what comes from our country is not as interesting, not as, you know, valuable. And then there's the concrete um, economic um, obstacles to exporting because we're not in the European Union. You need to pay huge custom fees if you want to export or import to Europe. You need specific certificates, specific licenses, and these imply big investments as well. So for many Tunisians, it's like, I mean, I just can't afford that. And even if they want to like come to Europe for a fair or, you know, to network or meet clients, getting a visa is not easy these days. So just like leaving the country as a human and making your product like leave the country is, is super tough. So this is, yeah, this is why we, we are not seeing a lot of Tunisians exporting their work and their talent. And yet there is a lot of, uh, I mean, the characteristics and the flavors in the, the olive varietals that you have. Um, and there are a number, but you talk, you know, we talked about the sort of two primary, um, variety. Yeah, the varieties, and they are... There's Shemlali and there's Shetui. Um, there's many more, but these are the two main ones. Shetui is a variety that we find in the northern part of Tunisia mostly, and it's more like grassy and, and pungent. And then Shemlali, we find it mostly in the center and south of Tunisia, which is historically the regions where olive trees were cultivated since... 
long, yeah, and long, long, long before there was olive oil in Spain and the first trees that were cultivated in Tunisia came with the Phoenicians who came from the Levant, basically. Mm -hmm. So that was thousands of years ago. And they're the ones who founded Carthage, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, people forget that we are, you know, a Mediterranean country. They forget or they don't even know. Like this is this is also something that, you know, and I this is going to sound very disparaging, but, you know, the Europeans have a better, probably a better appreciation for the cultures and countries around the Mediterranean because of their proximity. But Americans half the time don't know where any of these places are, which is sure. yeah. shocking. But so, OK, so they don't they kind of forget this history Um so, you know, th this this heritage uh, seems sort of lost yeah. in the history books. Um, yeah, and even Tunisians themselves, coming back to the question you were asking me, don't know much about their history because, I mean, they, they were either taught by French people, like in, in French schools, or they were taught like an authoritarian propaganda right. from, you know, Post independence, we've only, almost only, uh, had, uh, authoritarian regimes, which obviously have a propaganda that they want to sustain and, uh, you know, a messaging that they want to implement. So most Indians only know, uh, their ident identity, sorry, through a specific lens mm -hmm. that is not, uh, wide enough and, you know, nuanced enough. So, yeah, many Tunisians don't know about who they are. I mean, that's just why. I mean, Which is, I think, the worst thing about this whole situation is Tunisian themselves not being connected to their identity, their culture, and therefore knowing the value of who they are. I remember when I started thinking about launching the brand and went to the estates and started speaking with the workers there, um, and they said, first of all, they were like, oh my God, like, why would you even do that? Like, why would you even leave like Paris or Europe to come here? Like, you're crazy. People are leaving and you're coming back. So they, for them, it's like, what? Well, didn't you say it's sort of like the, uh, the West's version of what luxury is today is to go back to the past and live I, a I simple life? I explained to them, I tell them, you guys, I mean, it's, it's not my position to like, you know, give you a lesson because, we, you know, the grass is always green in the other side, but you need to realize that this lifestyle that you guys have is actually quite cool in Europe now. People have, you know, realized that the stress and the pollution and the busyness of our, you know, capitalist lives is detrimental to our health and relationships and joy, et cetera. And you guys live a good, simple life in, you know, in nature. And But is it good for them? I mean, obviously it has limitations. And I think the reason why it's not good for them is because they're not making money out of it. Right. Which they should be because they've been undervalued in the industry. I think if, if people were, if they were able to, you know, build businesses out of their land or if other people like, like other entrepreneurs had a more, uh, you know, inclusive and, uh, fair understanding of what business could should be and try to incorporate them in the picture in a you know more fair way then maybe they'd see the value of where they come from and the potential but because they are totally disadvantaged within the current system for them it's like what's what's to like about our life it's just so they think that the idea that you're coming back to your family's homeland to to build something that in in effect showcases sort of the the power and potential and beauty and richness of of the local culture they're sort of perplexed by this decision. I mean, you know, it depends. Some of them are are, are quite surprised in a positive way and they're like, "Wow, this is so cool." And they're happy. I there's this woman um on the who lives in the village. She's like almost 100 years old. She remembers my great 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 grandmother, which is insane because it's like I mean, yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> a long time ago. Um, and when she, because I didn't know her before. So when she met me, she instantly started speaking to me about my great, great, great grandmother and like stories and how she came and how she did. Da, da, da. And she was moved. She was like, you guys left 
it's so nice to see you coming back. So obviously some of them see, you know, the, the beauty in this and some others are just like, what are you doing? But then now that it's been, you know, two years ish, they understand that there is, um, a reason behind that mm -hmm. and, and they're interested. And effectively you are, trying to change the system on your own, you know, at your own level. Um, obviously, it's still the beginning, but I, I was quite um, moved when I first met you, met you by something you said, which was that this is sort of like a form of resistance by giving people a reason to, I guess, believe in their culture also. And and how do you do that, though? I mean, a part of it comes through employment, but also, I guess, building opportunity how yeah. do you see the system in um, in the way that you are approaching it? So because the current, I mean, the system as we know it um, has totally erased uh, culture, community, um, transparency, equity from the picture. What I'm trying to do is bring back all of this into the core of what I'm trying to build. Meaning, obviously, the people we work with are, I mean, during the harvest mm -hmm. and when we, when we have specific work on the estate, they're only people from the local village. So we're trying to like sustain that community spirit in the village and make sure it's not deserted, basically, by paying them, obviously, a better wage than if they work with, you know, the other traders or middlemen or whatever. Or the bulk traders too. Yeah. 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 Um, also just trying to bring more joy into the work. So, you know, having big lunches together and sharing stories and singing and, you know, even when journalists come, it's, it's amazing for them. So I, I want to make sure they don't feel like objectified. No, of course, but they yeah. actually really like it. And they're like, wow, like this is the first time someone comes, like people from America coming here to like meet us and speak with us. So it brings joy to the, you know, to the everyday life and a bit. A bit of like excitement as sure. well. Um, and, and, and then, yeah, I, I try to, I, th I think they just really see that I'm so passionate. So, so they feel passionate again. Right. Again. That's a, right. The right word. Yeah. Uh, it's infectious, I guess, in a way. I mean, obviously, this is just the first step. There's much more things that I need to do and I hope to do. Um, we are working on reinvesting into, in a new mill. And this will obviously mean hiring new people. Didn't you say you were going to revive, uh, the, your family's old mill? Yeah. So, but the old mill, um, is first of all, very old mm -hmm. and it's a savoir faire mm -hmm. that's been kind of lost. So it's not easy to, to find the people who know how to make those old machines work. And in terms of quality, the newer machines are actually better okay. to like control like high quality olive oil. So if you really want to make better quality, which I want to improve my quality as well, I think it's more, you know, it's more clever to invest in a new machine. But the the idea is to invest in a new machine in the state. So we'll have the old machines and the new machines um, next to each other. So this means obviously new jobs. Um, and then there's also old houses because my great grandfather used to live on the estate, which is not the case anymore. So actually, I have to drive to the estate every time from our, you know, from the town basically uh -huh. to the countryside. Uh, so refurbishing those homes and maybe turning them into like guest houses or mm -hmm. this also means like hiring more people and including them into that vision. Um, but you know, it's a, it's a work in progress. Sure. Sure. I mean, you really went from being a, a writer and a, and a journalist to, I'm just going to go back to my parents' place in Tunisia during COVID and, and then everything changed. Yeah. Essentially. I mean, it's, I got there in the summer of 2020 after two months of lockdown here in Paris. <laughs> and I realized how miserable I felt when I got there. I mean, I knew because it was, it was quite tough for me the first few weeks of COVID. Not because I was, you know, stressed to be alone, but 
just because I was like, nothing makes sense anymore. Right. And coming to Tunisia made me find, if I can say without sounding too cliche, but like a new sense of purpose, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. And it made me realize that I've always wanted to do something that felt a bit more real and tangible. And I needed this feeling to just feel more useful and mm -hmm. connected to who I am, I guess. And I found this in olive oil. Also, I love spending time in Tunisia and I was quite against the idea of Tunisia has to be a holiday destination and then work has to be in France. So why do we like accept this idea that countries like Tunisia have to, has to be like destinations on like holiday? Mm. I can work there and I'm going to figure it out. So for now, you are still going between Paris and... Yeah. Which obviously is a privilege that other Tunisians, most of, most of them at least, don't have. And that's what I was going to suggest, that, uh, you know, in some ways you might really be able to bring a lot of light to the olive oil market in Tunisia because you have this connection. Yeah. Not not only to France, but the rest of Europe. You're mobile here. Um, you've already done lots of tastings. I mean, uh, in my in my story, I, we talked about La Grande Épicerie being one of the big first um, big stores yeah. to to carry your olive oil, but you've done tastings there. You have great small grocers here, like Chanceux still has your olive oil yeah. and lots of different shops. And and how so how do you think do you think that's sort of like the 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 formula for success, at least right now, that might help bring more attention to not only what you're doing, but what's happening there? Well, because I come from a background of, you know, media and journalism, I knew that what made me happy was storytelling and, and telling stories. So for me, launching that business, obviously it was about producing olive oil and connecting myself to nature, but it was also about telling stories from Tunisia about my culture and et cetera. So the storytelling marketing element was key to my vision, which I think makes a big difference because I have this capacity. Um, and yeah, I think... Because you can... When when I spoke to the buyer, for example, at La Grande Épicerie, she said, you know, what was huge was that Sarah could be there to... Yeah. to to meet the clients who were tasting, you know, and, and answer questions and maybe illuminate... Yeah, I think first of all, it brings more trust because people can put a face on it. And it's not common to meet a producer who's young and who's a woman as well. So it's easy to engage a conversation and start, you know, something with, with the, with the consumer. And obviously just being here makes it, makes it obviously easier. Um, when I, again, when I had the idea of launching the business and told my father, listen, I think I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to do this. I thought from a very like intuitive way, I need to make sure there's a market for my product before I start investing big money into this. So for me, like the, the, the vision was being in Paris, making sure shops would be interested, the press would be interested, mm -hmm. people would be interested, and then think okay what can we do now in the estate to in you know to make this a proper thing instead of like investing in the estate and and then you know trying to find distributors which this is what most Tunisians do they invest in big mills they irrigate they plant new trees they do all of this and then they're like okay we need to find a way to distribute our product and i was like i'm i'm gonna start from where it is i'll figure it out i'm gonna see if people are interested and if they are then we're, we have something mm. and then we i can come back here and figure it out i don't know if it's the right way or the <laughs> wrong way it's just the way i did it well you you also you know you were here at first then yeah. you were there and then you came back so you had to sort of build within the environment you found yourself in too. I mean, the, you've got that, perhaps an advantage of, again, having that that dual, yeah, yeah, know, that for sure. dual identity in some ways. And so do you feel also like, um, I, I mean, I know you said your parents live full time in mm -hmm. Tunisia now. Yeah. Do you feel like France is um, 
is an open market for this is a is an has embraced because this is this is also part of your home i don't know how you how you break that down in your head everyone feels you know different with their multiple identities honestly i've accepted the idea that my life can be different things simultaneously and it's fine i don't know like where <laughs> where my home is and it's okay okay um But the French have embraced. I think so. Yeah. I mean, I grew up in London. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And before launching, I thought maybe London would be an easier market, you know, because it's a bit more diverse. And I feel like people are more curious maybe in London. Um, but I was like, you know, I, I left London a few years ago. Now Paris is my home and there's COVID. So I need to launch in Paris and this is what it is. Um, and now with, you know, the recul. Yeah, with a bit of distance. I th I think it's it's it, it was better to launch here. First of all, because French people know about Tunisia through you know the history. Uh, yeah, there is a lot of Tunisians and North Africans in France, so people are connected to that you know culture in some ways. And I'm not sure why. I don't know if it's a coincidence, but there is some type of trend around Tunisia. There's been lately. With like other products like Carissa and, uh, you know, ob obviously olive oil. But I feel like there's like something with happening. The, with the, with Shakshuka, you know. Right. Levantine cultures in general. Uh, it seems there's there's been a real... But there's been more visibility around Tunisia, I feel, lately. Um, so... I don't know if it's, if I'm unconsciously a part of this or if it's just luck, but I feel like also my brand was launched at the right time sure. where people were interested. Mm -hmm. There was the signal that people were interested in that type of cuisines and cultures. So I was there at the right time as also. Um, so yeah, yeah. I feel like French people have been open to the idea and have maybe less cliches than I think they'd have. Uh, what were you worried about? I think I was worried that people would think it's like a, you know, some type of like ethnic product that people associate with lower quality. You're using quotes around ethnic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a troubling word. You know, so I wanted to make sure that my product was rooted in its culture and identity, that it was you know, proudly Tunisian and North African. But without, uh, you know, pigeonholing it, if that makes sense, Absolutely. to a specific community or a specific, you know, positioning, which is often the case. So I wanted it to like, you know, be what it is, a premium, you know, organic, extra virgin olive oil, but without, uh, you know, erasing its culture. And and to bring this back full circle, you just so, as I mentioned in the beginning, you just spent this weekend at Taste of Paris. You had a stand uh, where people could come and meet you and try it and also try some Harissa, actually, yeah, that yeah. You're, you're launching. Yeah. What, now that you're a few days recovering from that, that intense experience, what was your impression of the people who came to to try things, to, to inquire Honestly, people were very curious and very open-minded. Um, I think they liked the stand, the aesthetic of it, yeah. which was very simple, by the way, <laughs> very <laughs> DIY, but looked nice. Apparently, I think yeah, people people liked it. Um, it was quite serene, and so I yes. think people were attracted to that, you know, serene Pinterest feel. <laughs> Um, and the pictures were beautiful. The pictures right. that actually came from some of them from the stories. That's right. Shot, uh, yes, yes, yes. From the Afar story. And they liked the tin as well. I think it helps when the it's packaging beautiful. is nice. It's blue and white. Yeah. Which people often associate with Greece. But in fact, it is just so people know. <laughs> it's inspired by the door of our family mill, which is a big blue door. And not only that, blue is another color that comes up a lot in Tunisia. It's not just the Greek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like but people are usually Greeks. think it's like, oh, this is Greek. I'm like, no, it's Tunisian. Yeah, people were very, very interested and they loved the Harissa as well, which I don't know when I will actually launch, but mm -hmm. hopefully soon. 
And some chefs also came to meet us on the stand. And that was fun. Yeah. Because today, where are you both in Paris and maybe in the States? Because I know you have a retailer in the States, right? Yeah, but it's 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 still like smaller. Small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But are so do you have just specialty stores or do you have certain restaurants and chefs that are starting to place orders? Uh, I also work with chefs and I have been working with chefs since the first couple of months, actually. Um, so that's, yeah, that's quite fun. Um, yeah, I, I guess maybe around 20 chefs or something. That's great. Yeah. So, so where can people find, uh, obviously they can order from the website yeah. if they're in France. France, France yeah. Okay. Shipping fees are too expensive. I mean, it's, yeah. So I don't open the website too. And if they are elsewhere, where might they find it? Elsewhere from France, you mean like abroad? Yeah. I mean, we're launching in the UK, I think next month. <laughs> Where? In like a big store. That you can't n mention yet? I mean, I, don't, I, I think I can. <laughs> it's just like, I'm so scared of like jinxing things. But although like it's confirmed, but it's it's the equivalent of like Le Bon Marché in London. Amazing. Okay. So you can like follow me on Instagram and you'll hear about yeah, it. Yeah, let's, let's, let's do it that way. <laughs> to, if you're unsure of what she's referring to, you got to follow her on Instagram <laughs> yeah. to know. Um, so that's for the UK and hopefully other shops in the UK after that. Um, honestly, yeah, it's mostly France. There's this store in, in New York and San Francisco called Sabah, uh -huh. which is quite nice. It's a concept store, artisanal concept store. I'm thinking of going to the States soon to maybe like meet distributors. Um, and then it's Paris, Marseille. Ah, oh, Marseille. Are you at, um, Provisions? I am at Provisions. In Marseille, yeah, that's a great And store. a couple of other shops. Um, and some other shops in pr provincial towns of France. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, but not in Europe, like not in other European countries. Hey, not yet. Start, start yeah. with the people who, you know, have an affinity for this product already. I mean, yeah. the English do too, but, you know, I think what you said is very... Uh, very sharp, which is that the French have already a, a different connection yeah, to yeah. Tunisia, and so I think maybe the 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 awareness gap is much 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 smaller. Yeah. Um. And baby steps. You're you're still it's still a new brand. Yeah. And, and Greece. Speaking about Greece is is a is an interesting case study because 15 years ago nobody knew about Greek olive oil. Actually, it was all about Italy, Italy, Italy. Uh. And now they're everywhere. Well, and and that's also from some French Greeks yeah. who have really uh, raised the the spotlight. The Greek diaspora in general. Yeah, I mean, I obviously as someone who lives in France, I'm not really familiar with some of the maybe the brands or products uh, for Greek olive oil that have emerged in the U.S. But obviously here we know of a, a handful. Mm -hmm. um, but it's interesting because I think I always. Yeah, I always assumed Italy or uh, or or Greece, and then I'm 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 looking at sort of the 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 rankings of of uh, cultures that produce it, and and Spain is yeah. also highly. Spain ranked, is number one, which to me I don't know why this surprised <laughs> me. I mean, obviously the 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 land and the um, like geographically, mm. it makes sense that they had the capacity. I mean, do the port? I'm sure the Portuguese must as well. Yeah, I think Portuguese are maybe like the fifth or something, but Spain is like by far number one. But actually, the reason why people not really don't really know is that Spain is the first consumer of Spanish olive oil. Ah, that's why. Okay. Whereas Italians export a lot. A lot. Tunisians almost only export, unfortunately. And I think Rick is like a mixture. How fascinating. I mean, but this just goes to show you that there's a lot that we should, A, be paying attention to. Uh, we pay attention to, you know, where our wines come from. Mm -hmm. We pay attention to where, you know, some of our other ingredients come from. Why aren't we taking just a, a second longer to think about what's written on these bottles and maybe not to assume that, you know, just because it's Italian or Spanish, it's necessarily you know, the top shelf. Um, and also, no, maybe sometimes you'll buy an it a bottle that sounds Italian. Right. But it's just not Italian. <laughs> I mean, th this is the thing. We, th that's, that's a big marketing move. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, this, this happens. People don't have the awareness. And so this is a, a an important shift. 
Yeah. And I, I remember we, we had a conversation another day, um, at Abil, you know, this cafe. Yes. Yes. And we spoke about, uh, you know, the local food movement, which obviously is super important. And sometimes people will challenge me and say, oh, mais it's not made in France. So, you know, I'm not sure I want to buy. I want to go like full made in France. And, and I try to explain that supporting businesses like mine is supporting a local, you know, philosophy because we work direct, you know, it's the direct trade is from us to you literally without no middlemen. And if you don't support businesses like us, you help the other unjust system to, you know, continue and, and flourish. So if we want to like change things and make things more, you know, fair for everyone and make sure we can exchange our cultures in a way that is more, you know, reciprocal, businesses like mine need to be, you know, supported. You make a very good point. I was just having this conversation with someone yesterday, actually with Kemi from Abila. Okay. I was there and we were talking about made in France as if somehow that has become such a um, a consumer ambition, but without consumers realizing that it doesn't necessarily mean it will be higher quality or people will be paid fairly. And mm. and one of the things she cited was in the neighborhood of where her store and restaurant is, there is some sort of like almost underground basement kind of uh, atelier with some seamstresses yeah. who barely see the light of day and are probably getting paid garbage. So, yeah. okay, what they're producing is made in France. Does that mean that it's a just system? And I think that's what people need to, we need to go one step further. Yeah. And not necessarily stop at, well, it's made in the 10th arrondissement and therefore it is necessarily better than something else. And also, if we want to make sure that people in, you know, the global south, as we call it, yep. um, can live, you know, a good life without continuing to dream about leaving and risking their lives as they do that and, you know, live in exile far from their family, which is also something that's, you know, hard to do then we need to make sure they can live, uh, you know, yeah, a fair life at home. Living with dignity. I mean, it yeah. seems like such a basic idea that the French should get. But, you know, there, there's this, there are these competing narratives also, you know, consume yeah, local, consume local. And what does that actually mean? And what is actually better? And people are confused. So yeah, I think yeah, having yeah. these conversations is already an important first step. Sarah, where, where can people follow along as you develop this brand? You mean online? Yeah, or wherever. I mean, do you? I mean, you you don't have any pop up scheduled right now. Mm, I mean, I just got a DM, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there might be a pop up uh, first weekend of June, but I haven't confirmed. Otherwise, they can find Kaya at La Grande Épicerie in Paris. Mm -hmm. Next month, I will be launching at Le Printemps as well. Oh, exciting! Yeah, and then in a you know a, a myriad of small shops, there's Chanceux in the 11e which is fantastic. Um, but there's also Les Épiceries Berry. Uh, there's a Maison Cuillerée, not too far from here, which is this nice uh, homeware shop. Uh -huh. um, honestly, there's like uh, so many of them now in Paris. But And then they can follow you on Instagram. But yeah, they can follow us on Instagram at World of Kaya. And I will put that in the show notes, so make it make it easier for everyone. It's also the website URL, like worldofkaya.com. Um I'm still in charge of, you know, the Instagram. So if you send the DM, I usually reply. <laughs> so you can't get more uh, direct than that. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. And if you find me at a tasting, then yeah, it's also me. Yeah. Please talk to her. But honestly, Kaya has been such a, a, a gift, not just for, for Parisians, but also in my own personal kitchen. So thank you. You know, meeting you was, was such a, such a special treat. And I'm so glad we got to finally do this. Yeah. Me too. Thank you so much for having me. Merci, Sarah. Merci. That's the show for today. Thanks for listening, as always. If you're streaming this on Spotify, be sure to check out a little poll that awaits you pertaining to this discussion. Just scroll down on the episode page within the app and vote. And if you enjoy the show, I'd love it if you'd subscribe, share with a friend, and pick up the books that inspired it, The New Paris and The New Parisienne. Until next time, à bientôt.